new day to you, and we are happy to be back with you for Pastor's Corner. But first thing we want to apologize, we um, haven't been with you for the past three weeks. We were involved in Megafest. As a result of that, there was some inconvenience. So we missed you, and we're really happy that you are able to um, reconnect with us today as we spend such a wonderful time um, discussing such an interesting topic. Um, today we'll be speaking about revisiting our heritage. So basically we'll be talking a lot today about heritage. Um, so without any further ado, I just want to encourage you to um, like the page, um, share the link with somebody so they can join and we, they can be part of what transpired here uh, today. At this point in time, let's bow our heads and let us pray. Our God and our Father, we give you thanks and praise for your love. We thank you, God, for your grace. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, to die, that we can have life and have it more abundantly. And today, dear God, as we come to discuss and to lead out in such an interesting discussion, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be with me as I host, dear God, and be with the panelists. And we pray at the end that men and women, boys and girls who tune in, they will be edified and also they will be drawn closer to you. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so today... And I have some competent men of God with me this morning, and I would like to, um, to in allow them to introduce themselves. So to my extreme left, I have a gentleman there, and he will um, tell you his name and the, probably the church he is pastoring, and I'll something a little about himself. Greetings. My name is Pastor Jerry Vincent from the Southwestern District, Concord, Grand Roy, Mount Morris, and... I'm missing one. Grant, no. Bushes you. Always forget that one. <laughs> All right, thank you, Pastor Vincent. And then to my immediate left, I have somebody there with me again, another competent gentleman. Well, um, good morning, everybody. Let me say welcome. My name is Pastor Eustace George. I am an intern pastor at the South Central District. I'm directly responsible working along with Pastor Graham with the St. Paul's, Bolio, and New Hampshire congregations. Amen. And um, something about me, yeah, you yeah. said, Pastor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I like to say um, a Dominican by birth okay, good. and a grenade in that hat. All right, all right, all right. Amen, amen. Nice, nice, okay. All right, so we're ha we happy to have them with us um, today. And as we get into the discussion, I want you to understand that as you look at the topic of heritage, um, there are some people who are strongly to the heritage. Um, and sometimes people might want to know what is your heritage, and different people might have different view of what your heritage can be. Um, so today we will start by setting the foundation of what is a heritage, and we'll go down into, into some in-depth um, discussion as to what is, what is the Seventh-day Adventist Church's heritage. All right. So my first question is, can you please define the word heritage and its relevance? And I will start with um, Pastor Vincent. Can you define the term or the word heritage and its relevance? How important it is? Well, heritage is our legacy from the past. Uh, what we live with today. And what we pass on to our future generations. Now, inspiration says to us, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and is teaching in our past history. We are now a strong people. So your heritage, basically, you're saying that's your past. Our legacy of what happened in the past. Our legacy of what happened in the past. Yeah. Pastor George? Yeah, certainly I agree with Pastor Vincent on his take on heritage. Heritage has a lot to do with your roots. Yes, okay. yes. Where you come from. It speaks to your foundation. And um, when you consider heritage, you take a look at history. Okay. You take a look at inheritance. And you draw from history pieces of, of items, we could call them, you know, objects, beliefs, um, stories, even traditions, and uh, events that have happened in the past that has brought you to where you are. Um, I was sitting at the barber shop the other day and there was something playing on the TV while I waited. And it really, it really spoke to me. And even as I, we consider um, heritage today, I like to share it. It said that where you begin your story 
It's very important. True. Okay. Because that's where you start your narrative as to who you are and who you can become. And so that in itself speaks to heritage. You need to know where you come from. You need to know why you are the way you are, why, why you, you make the choices that you make today. And that, that is hinged greatly on your foundation, your roots. So heritage has a lot to do, a lot to do with your roots. All right, thank you. So heritage, basically, you are saying is, is, is fundamental to a person or an organization. Um, because what you see presently, there is always something behind it that fueled or guide that person or that institution to the point where they are presently. All right, and this can consider to be the heritage. So what is the relevance? What is the relevance of, of knowing where you come from? Or what is the relevance of the events of the, or the things that happened in the past um, to, to create your heritage? What's the relevance of that? No, yes, as we, as we just mentioned, as I was just trying to highlight, um, your heritage is very relevant to you today because it, it helps you understand your present and helps you understand where you're heading, your future. So the past is not just there for the past's sake. It, it is there for a foundation that you can build on and understand your present and your future. All right, thank you very much. All right, so can you please explain the meaning of the name Seventh-day Adventist and why was that name chosen, Pastor George? All right, um, it's interesting that we speak of heritage and you now we make yeah. mention of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Of course, we know um, viewers, that this this Mission Life Pastors Corner mm -hmm. program you know, is 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 part of the seven day, the work of the Seventh Day Adventist Church here in Grenada, and we speak to the name Seventh Day Adventist. Now, what what I really like about the Seventh Day Adventist Church, one thing that I, I like about the Seventh Day Adventist Church is that this church is not a fly by night church. Nobody don't wake up one morning and decide to put up a structure and say, yeah, here is the Seventh-day Adventist church. This, this church has a name, and its name is part of, part of its heritage. And it, it is interesting that this name came about about a century and a half ago. It, it started somewhere in October 1st, 1860. And when we take a look at our heritage, again, our history, would find Seventh-day Adventists. It is a name that has three parts, Seventh-day Adventists. And we, we want to know why this name was chosen, what is the significance. And we could, to, to understand, we have to look closely at these three parts, Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day referring to the biblical Sabbath day of rest. And this, this was graciously given to us by God but not only that, it was recognized and kept by Jesus Christ himself when he came here. And Adventist, which points to the assurance of the second advent of Jesus Christ, the second return. So when we look at the name, there is meaning in this name. Mm -hmm. There is great meaning in this name. And this name speaks to what God expects of us to be Seventh-day Sabbath keepers. And to be Advent is looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. All right. Thank you. Um, Pastor Vincent, do you want to add anything to, to what he had said? Uh, I just uh, want to stress on why was that name chosen. Now, in the early years, the church was, was not so much a legal organization. Okay. Now, you have to be legal. You have to have a name to own property. Now, most of the property of the church, uh, the meeting house, the meeting house and the, the press, printing press, they actually belong to James White. Okay. Yeah? And if he died, it would pass to his children, not the church members who supported the venture. So the church needed to have a name in order to own property legally. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So... And we understand the meaning of the name and we understand why the name was chosen. Um, because if you want to move forward and to make legal um, argument and, and um, accomplish different things, then there must be something um, that can tie you to, to a name whereby people can identify 
who you are and um, where you are going. All right, so that's very interesting so far because, um, as, as was mentioned, we are um, pastors of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, so we just told you the reason why we have the name Seventh-day Adventist and um, what the name mean. Um, additionally, what would you consider as a, as a heritage of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Because the Adventist Church is not just um, fall from the sky and appear. Um, the Adventist Church probably go through some different challenges, different trials, um, different things that transpire, different events that form the church today to what it is. Um, so can you um, give us some insight and our viewers what are the heritage or what would you consider the heritage of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? I would first of all like to say that our heritage is what makes us unique as a church. Uh, first of all, the name we, ha we keep, the seven-day Sabbath. Also, there are certain beliefs that we have that is unique to seven-day Adventism. Now, we believe that one day we will have the live, living in an earthly home. Now, if you study the other churches, most churches believe that we are going to live in heaven. That is going to be our home. But the Adventist church is one of, one of the only churches who will tell you the earth made you is going to be our home. Now, a lot of other denominations believe in the immortality of souls. We do not believe that. We believe that when a person dies, he sleeps until the resurrection. These are unique to our heritage as a church, as well as the doctrine of the heavenly sanctuary. And there are many others. The investigative judgment that uh, commenced in 1844. So we have all these things as part of our heritage, and it helps define us as a church. All right, thank you very much. So those events help to shape the church um, to what it is today. All right, Pastor George, you want to add some, some things, uh, events that transpired that shaped the church to what it is today? Certainly. Um, Pastor Vincent alluded to, to certain principles, doctrines that the Seventh-day Adventist Church embrace. And they are doctrines that are peculiar to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That makes the heritage very rich. Yep. Um, as, as we look at the history of the church, we find specific events that help mold and, and form the church into what it is today. But at at the core and at the helm, what we would find is something that is very important, a deep study of the word of God. Amen. Okay, okay, yes. good. Deep study of the word of God. And that is one, that is one piece of the seven Adventist church history that stands out. Every principle, every doctrine, um, Pastor Vincent mentioned a few of them, guided by the word of God, the Bible, and therein lies our source of truth. Not tradition, not reason, the word of God, the Bible. And so this church, part of its heritage is, is that it is built on biblical principles. Amen, yes. Bible. If it's the Bible, we embrace it. If it's, if, if it's not Bible, then it, it cannot form the doctrines that we stand on. True. And so, secondly... Something that's very important to the heritage of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the spreading of the gospel. And yes, we look at events in our past, but these things stand core to our heritage, the spreading of the gospel. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church embrace the, the mandate, the commission given by Jesus Christ, found in Matthew 28, 19, 20. Go ye therefore. Go ye therefore into all the world. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So, for this church, part of the heritage has always been the word of God, 
and to spread the good news of salvation. All right, thank you very much. All right, and with the formation of every heritage, um, um, things, ju things just do not happen by themselves. There must be individuals who are behind those events, all right? Um, so we will take a break. We'll have a special music. And then when we return, we'll speak about some individuals. We'll find out who they were and some of the um, contribution and the impact that they made um, towards the formation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. So at this point in time, we'll turn over to have a special music. All right, we want to give God thanks and praise for that wonderful music, special music that was done by Brother Johnny Noel. 
All right, may God continue to bless you and bless your family as you continue to allow him to use you, use you for his honor and for his glory. All right, so we continue. And as I was telling you before we took the break, that with all heritage formation, um, there are individuals who are involved in the formation of heritage. So at this point in time, we'll speak um, of some of the individuals. Um, so one of the persons we want to speak about is who was William Miller and what can the Seventh-day Adventist Church attributed um, attribute to him towards his existence. So what, what um, contribution he made towards the existence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So first thing, you will tell us who was William Miller, that's Pastor George, and then you will tell us what contribution he made towards the existence of the church. Okay, so an honored Seventh-day Adventist cannot speak to the history of Seventh-day Adventism without highlighting William Miller. Okay, True. True. You yeah. cannot. You cannot. He, he, he has... He has a large role to play in the history of this church. We could look at his, his part that he played, and we would see that indeed he was a, a founding father. You know? He, he stands there as a founding father who developed, um, to a large extent, what we now have as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. William Miller is one who is noted as a man who, who led the groundwork for Seventh-day Adventism. Okay. Yes. And so we find William Miller in the books of history living somewhere in the 1830s. And he was a farmer. He was a military veteran. He was a devout Baptist. Mm -hmm. And he was a good preacher. Yes, ma'am. Powerful good man Good preacher of, of the word. Mm -hmm. And as a Bible student, William Miller engaged himself in deep Bible study. And so it is noted that after returning from war, he, 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 he engaged in deep study of Daniel and Revelation, prophecy. And as he studied the prophecies, he eventually concluded that Jesus' second coming would be a literal event rather than a figurative or spiritual event. Okay. And so he looked in a very, very, in a very special way at Daniel 8.14, and we know that prophecy, I, I like to read it to, to us this morning. It says, sure. And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Yes. And he became convinced that this predicted the exact date that when the second coming would be. So re remember that when we speak of Seventh-day Adventists, we speak of folks who look towards the second coming of Jesus Christ. Definitely, yes. And, and that was William Miller. He looked forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so, based on the events described in the passages of Daniel Revelation, he, he predicted and concluded that Jesus Christ would return between 1843 and 1844. Mm -hmm. And so, William Miller believe, believed this. He preached fervently about the nearness of the second coming. And he gained a lot of followers. Many yeah, people yeah. Looked, looked at their lives and they started focusing and studying the Bible. And October 22nd, 1844 came. All right. It did come. Mm -hmm. it, it showed up and the folks were there and they were ready to go to heaven when, when Jesus returned. And they, they were called the Millerites because they followed William Miller. But interesting enough, when, when October 22nd, 1844 came, there was a great disappointment. Okay. And, and Jesus did not return on that date, but it was a beginning of something that would blossom into something beautiful. Okay. Because while that date, to, as um, up to today, is referred to as a great disappointment, it was the date for many where they went deeper into the study of God's word. All right, so I just want to ask as you, as you go, I don't want you to go too deep into 1844. Mm. I want you to speak now. So as William, William, William Miller preached and predicted that Jesus would come at, at that point in time. Um, with that type of movement, right, the Millerite movement, and so many people were following him, um, how did that contribute directly to the formation or, or the heritage of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Now, there were different groups that were formed following 1844. Great disappointment. And one of those groups were the, the Sabbatarian Adventists. Okay. And th those folks, based on their name, you will note that they, they kept the Sabbath and they looked forward to Jesus' second coming. 
and they went deeper into study. Okay, thank you very much. All right. So, uh, how significant is, is October 22nd, 1844, um, to the Seventh day Adventist Church? Pastor Vincent. There was a great disappointment because they made a mistake in the interpretation of the meaning of the cleansing of the sanctuary. As my colleague said, William Miller taught it was the cleansing of the earth and Jesus was coming. But that was not the case. It brought about the great disappointment. The mistake in the interpretation of the prophecy did not involve the calculation of the chronolog chronolog chronological of the 2300 years, but only the nature of the event to take place. Now, what happened in 1844? October the 22nd, 1844. Christ left the holy place mm -hmm. and entered the most holy place. And there began the second phase of the heavenly sanctuary, which is termed as the investigative judgment. Okay. Jesus okay. was not to come. It was Jesus moving from one apartment of the heavenly sanctuary to another part. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So we get a synopsis of what transpired. William Miller preached that um, Jesus was coming on the 22nd of October, 1844. This did not happen. What really transpired is the movement, uh, for the movement of Christ moving from the holy into the most, most holy, holy place. And after that, due to the, the type of persons or the group, different groups who were following Miller, um, there are those who kept the Sabbath. So as a result of that, they continue to keep the Sabbath. Additionally, they went down into some more studies. And as we get deeper into the discussion, we realize what transpired with those individuals. Um, so with this in mind, can you share with us the, the historical background and context of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Some historical background and context of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We touched that a little lightly um, higher up where we spoke about um, the name, the name, and what was the significance of the name and why the name was chosen, but we want to go a little deeper into that. F f first of all, the early, at the great disappointment, the truth about the Sabbath was not as yet revealed to the believers. William Miller, William Miller himself did not keep the Sabbath. Okay. Yeah. So uh, in, in that early, early 1844, the Sabbath truth had not been recognized by the church because at the time there was no church. Okay. Yeah? All right. Okay. But right. Judge, Pastor Judge, you want to add something to that? Go ahead. Let me just add to that. Um, coming out of October 22nd, 1844, obviously many people were disappointed. Definitely. They were disappointed. Imagine that you, you sold lands and you, you give away stuff, you know? You close shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you're looking forward to leave this world behind and mm. go to a better place, yes. you know? A sinless place. And then 12 o'clock midnight strikes and no Jesus has not come. And so many people were disappointed. Many people were disappointed. Some of them were angry. And then there were others who were scared. Mm. And then when we look at them, there were folks who went back to their way of life before they received this truth that Jesus was about to come on that date. But very importantly, there was a group that went back to Bible study. Amen. Yes. And they, they, they were wondering, where did we go wrong? Mm -hmm. What did we miss? What did we miss? Mm -hmm. What was the mistake? And so... For the next 15 years, many former Millerites continued their studies of prophecy yes. and the, coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ to see what they could learn and get this thing right. Very important to note. Okay, thank you very much. All right. So what contribution was made to the Seventh-day Adventist Church by, by the following person? So we just spoke about Miller, um, and um, William Miller made some contribution. Uh, we spoke about the preaching of the second coming of Christ and and the disappointment that happened and all that. But there are some other persons who made some contribution. 
So I want to know about John Byington. What, what about this person? What contribution they made um, to the church heritage? Well, of course, Pastor, if we, if we have to highlight all the persons who play significant roles in the emergence and the development and what we now have as a Seventh-day Adventist church, this session would definitely not be long enough. True, true, true. But um, I appreciate the fact that we'll highlight a few of them this morning. Definitely. And, and John Byington is indeed one person that we must highlight this morning. He's, he's, he's referred to as a circuit riding preacher. Mm-hmm. Okay, to explain that to the, to the viewers, man. The man went around preaching. All right. Preaching the horse, word. On his horse. <laughs> and um, he, he, he's referred to as an abol- abolitionist and the first general conference president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And All that right. happened when um, James White did not take the office because of personal reasons. Thank you very much, right? So the first president of the general conference was John Byington, right? Yep. The offer was given to, um, to James White. He refused it and for his personal reason. And then John Byington was the first general conference president. All right? So we're moving on to the next individual, Joseph Bates. Joseph Bates. Pastor Vincent? Joseph Bates was a retired sea captain. Uh, he was one of the early believers. The unique thing about him, uh, his heritage to this church, is that he brought the seven-day Sabbath understanding of the truth of the seven-day Sabbath to the church. Even wrote, published a 48-page track on the subject. All right, thank because you. At the time, the church were not keeping the Sabbath, the seven-day Sabbath. So, so Joseph Bates was the one that brought it to their attention? No, it was Rachel Oaks, I believe. He, he was the one who, who uh, published about it to all the believers. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. All right, thank you very much. We, we, um, just to add on, on, on Joseph Bates, Joseph Bates ha- had made a, a, a significant contribution with regards to his ability to connect theologically yeah. the Sabbath with a unique understanding of the heavenly sanctuary. And so... When we think of Joseph Bates, we must think of the, the introduction of the Sabbath truth to a lot of people and the introduction of the, the concept of the sanctuary as well to many people. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Then we go to Stephen Haskell. Mm. Stephen Haskell. Well, Stephen Nelson Haskell. Mm-hmm. That's his full name there. Um, very interesting fellow. He, he played a role in many important part, parts of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This includes the publishing ministry, the, the world missions, urban evangelism, and even conference administration. And when we consider Stephen Haskell, what, what comes to mind is one who, who, who can be regarded as an international pioneer. Mm, true. You know, he traveled from country to country to share, to, to evangelize, to develop. And part of, part of the, the, the work moving forward in, in other parts, such as Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Britain, Europe, um, China, India, even Japan, other parts in the Asian lands, has to greatly be attributed to the work that he did. Great All right. Work. So he was a, 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 a type like Paul. Certainly. All right, type like also, Paul. also, also, uh, he was the first to organize. He, he he organized the first Seventh Day Adventist Church of African American heritage in New York. All right, it's in 1902. You. Okay, thank you very much. All right, then we go to John Andrews. John Andrews. This is a a, a person that also add to the heritage of the church. What contribution they made? Um, he made um, Pastor Vincent. Now, Jane Andrew was a theologian, so doctrine was his, his strong point. Uh, he, we are told he applied the two-horned beast of Revelation 13 to the United States. He also, he also adopted the sunset Friday evening at the beginning of the Sabbath. Okay. Because earlier on, the church was just keeping it from the standard time. Uh, 12 o'clock, Sabbath starts, 12 o'clock it finishes. 
but, but, but he put forward, adopted the belief that sunset Friday to sundown on Saturday. Saturday, all right. Yeah. And this is this is strong biblical backing. Backing. All right, this is strong biblical backing. Brother and um, Pastor Pastor George, really, do you want to share something with us? Well, not really. <laughs> All right. He good. was the first SD missionary in Switzerland. Okay, good. Yeah. Nice. Right. Well, so we're going to another person, and after that, we will take a, a promotional video after we finish deal with um Haram Edson. So who was Haram Edson and what was his association to the early advent movement? Now, Hiram Edson, um, very interesting guy. We, we can refer to him as, as a farmer in the cornfield. Mm. Okay, okay. It sounds farm, interesting. It sounds farmer interesting. farmer in the cornfield. And if you, if you stick that title to Hiram Edson, anytime his name comes up, you'll remember a very important part that he played in, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Hiram Edson, he... he he was in the cornfield, he said, and this is an exact quote. He said, he said he was in the cornfield and he was walking as he felt as if a hand was laid on his shoulder. Okay. And he seemed to have a vision of the heavenly sanctuary where he saw that Jesus had that very day entered into the most holy place and of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the work of judgment. So, Haram Edson received this vision in the cornfield. So that's why when we think of him as a farmer in the cornfield, we, we must think of him as a farmer in the cornfield who received this explanation as to what happened in October 22nd, 1844. 1844. Now, as we mentioned, October 22nd, 1844, and Hiram Edson, Following that disappointment, Aram Edson made, made an interesting um, statement. This is what he said. I'd like, like to read it to us this morning. He said, our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted. Mm. And such a spirit of weeping came over us as I have never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comparison. Mm. We wept. And wept till the day dawned. Mm. So I can, I can imagine when October 22nd, 1844 came. And from morning the folks looking. Mm. They're looking. Whole day they're looking. They're looking. Night, night came and they're looking. 12 o'clock midnight came and they're yeah. still looking. And when they saw that a new day is at dawn. They were disappointed, and he describes the sin of those who held that prophecy, that 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 anticipation there to their heart. They wept, they wept, and they wept, and they wept. And then it, it, it says to me, there was every reason why a man like him needed to receive that vision, because he was of that part of people who who held on to the fact that Jesus is coming and is coming now. Okay, thank you. Pastor Vincent, do you want to add anything to it? What did they do with the vision? He told his friends, they got together, and they studied the, the, the sanctuary. They studied the vision that they had, and they opened the Bible, and they studied until they understood it from a biblical standpoint, viewpoint. All right, thank you very much. At this point in time, we'll have a um, promotional video, and after that, we come back and we um, do some wrapping up. So we want you to stay tuned and remember to like and still you can still share with someone so they too can be blessed of what is happening here. From the youth department of the Grenada Conference of Seventh-day Adventists is the Festival of the Arts in an explosion of praise. Join the excitement as talents from across the island are displayed in music, drama, poetry, instrumentals and the arts. Every district will be represented in this flamboyant symphony of praise. Festival of the Arts. Don't miss it. All right. Thank you very much. And great things are happening in the Seventh-day Adventist Church at the Grenada Conference. And we are encouraging you to plan to be part of this film festival. Um, last year, it was, it was unable to be um, open to, the, to everyone coming in. But this year it will be bigger, it will be better, 
plan to be there. It will be a wonderful family time. Um, so you can come, be blessed, be entertained, and have some sweet fellowship. All right, today we are discussing revisiting our heritage. And um, so far we have been having we, we have been having a good time. I got some competent um, gentlemen with me. I got Pastor Vincent to my extreme left, and I got to my immediate left, I got um, Pastor George. And the men of God, they are doing a wonderful job. All right, so at this point in time, we continue. As we discuss individuals who made contribution to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the two names, the two, final two persons we'll be discussing is James White and Ellen White. So tell us about these two individuals and what contribution they made um, to the formation, to the heritage of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Although God has no favorites and no one is invaluable or irreplaceable with God, Ellen and James White, they allowed God to use them in a mighty way. Now, I believe and I know they are examples to us of dedication, perseverance, and duty above all else. Now, William... Adventist history tells us that Hazel Foss and William Floyd refused to accept the calling of God. They refused to do that work. Ellen Gould White responded positively to the unpleasant task. Okay. It was an unpleasant task. Now, she, in the church, she's recognized as a genuine non canonical prophet. So, which so, means. So, hold on, I just want to interject past. You're telling us about Ellen White or about Ellen James White? White? Sorry, I'm talking about Ellen White. All yeah? right. She was a genuine non canonical prophet, which basically means she was a non biblical prophet. She's not in the. She's not. She's not. The prophets in the Bible, she's outside the Bible. And there are many prophets who are outside the Bible. She, she had been called in God to restore the truths of the last days. So she, she had played a critical role in the formation of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And she has helped to define the mission of the church to the world. All right. Thank you very much. Pastor George. Now, even, even um, I would like to comment to a larger extent on James White, but even before I, I speak to him, um, Ellen White is a significant figure in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. God revealed stuff to her um, in this modern day that we can, when we read literature from her, we can see in clear view this must have been inspired mm. by God. Um, Ellen White, we must understand, had the gift of prophecy. She had the gift of prophecy. And the gift of prophecy, spirit of prophecy, that's a, that's a discussion by itself. But Ellen White had the gift of prophecy. And we would understand as we, looked, as we look down the corridor of history, of humanity, there has always been a prophet. There has always been a man, a woman who God speaks to. Um, to speak to his people. Message is relevant for the day in preparation for what is to come. And at, at a modern day, Ellen White was chosen by God to be a mouthpiece. A mouthpiece. And God spoke and revealed um, a, lot of, a lot of information to her through, through vision. Now, James White, he's, he's, he was a wife, her husband, sorry, <laughs> he was a husband, and when we, when we consider James White, he, he can be regarded as a co-founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay. No, that I did not say the Sabbatarian Adventists or the Millerites, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, because he was there around the time when the name was chosen. Okay. And along with, with Ellen White and Joseph Bates, and so when we look at the person of James White, there are a lot of interesting facts about him. Mm. After a year of teaching, yeah. James learned of the Millerite message from his mother. And you know what his response to that was? 
he devoted himself to the preaching of the Advent doctrine. Devoted himself to the preaching of it. And one instance, one year, he baptized a thousand persons through his preaching. So he was an evangelist. We look at him and he was a leader. He was a publisher. He led out in, 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 in health reform with his wife, education. And so when we, when we look at, at him, i like to highlight to us this morning, um, sometime, sometime around 1865, James was taken by his wife to Dansville, New York, to get hyper, hydropathic, that is water therapy yeah. institution. Yeah. And though he received some help, there were several practices that did not agree with the concepts Mrs. White had been shown in vision. And so after three months, they, they, they went to Rochester, New York, where on Christmas Day, mm -hmm. she had a vision that led her husband to establish what we have as the Western Health Reform Institute in Battle Creek that following year. And so this was the beginning of what was to become the Battle Creek Sanitarium. And so we have medical institutions, we have publishing work, we have organizations that begun because of the work and the life of James White. And so just, just, just to, to highlight, both Ellen White and James White contributed to a large extent to evangelism, education, health, and publishing within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay, thank you very much. Well, with such um, information... And as we look forward to the second coming of Christ, what would you say is the role of the Seventh-day Adventist Church today? Because based on the information that was given today, um, it seems, or uh, we can conclude, that the church has a strong heritage. Mm -hmm. The Very church true. has gone through some rough times, some good times, and the church has some serious backing. So with all those backings and all the, 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 the building blocks that has been added to the church by the different individuals that were mentioned, or who was mentioned, sorry, um, what is our responsibility today as we look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ? And this, this will also be your closing remarks. Pastor, Pastor Vincent? God's church is the apple of his eye. Not only that, but we have been given a special message to the world. If we do not give it, nobody else can. I'm talking about the three angels' message. God has given his church this message to preach to the world. Other denominations do not understand it as we understand it. Therefore, they cannot preach that three angels' message. Thank you very much, Pastor George, and your closing remarks. Yes. Um, I want us to live here this morning, this afternoon, sorry, um, reminded of the fact that this church, this Seventh day Adventist church, I'm convinced, and you would agree with me, that this church is here by no chance. True. It didn't come about by chance. It, it, it's not a work of, it's not an accident, you know? And when we look at the history, the heritage of this church, the Seventh day Adventist Church, God worked with imperfect men. True. Sure. To start up this work, to, to carry out this work. And to this day, um, this work is across the world. Worldwide, yeah. Worldwide. It's not a, a, a church found only in Grenada or the Caribbean. It is worldwide. And so when we look at our history, we look at our heritage, what we find there, we find folks who understood the fact that God has expectations of us, Sabbath keeping, to follow his Ten Commandments, not part of it, all of it. Yeah. Um, we find folks who understood the importance of deep Bible study, we find folks who understood the fact that Jesus Christ will return. It is a certain. It has to happen. It must happen. If every promise concerning Jesus has been fulfilled, and it's been fulfilled, then that promise that he will return has to be fulfilled. True, definitely. Amen. And yeah. so we find folks who held on to the gospel commission to go, to preach, to teach, to baptize. 
and to, to share the word, to lead men and women to a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, very importantly, as we look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ, the role of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to continue the work. Amen. Continue the work. Continue preaching. Continue teaching. Continue sharing. Continue health reform. And um, participating in education and literature. The, the printed pages, Ellen White herself says, speaks to it. You know, many persons are rich through that medium far more than, than you know, walking by the side road or, or, or pitching a tent. Many persons, the printed pages. And so, in addition to doing that, to preaching, to teaching, very importantly for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we must leave the sermons that we preach. Thank you. Amen. We have right. to. And Thank you so very much. That, that, that is our greatest sermon. Let me add that, Pastor. Amen. Okay, Amen. Good, thanks. All right, so I want to thank the gentlemen, Pastor Vincent and Pastor George, for joining us today as we discuss such an interesting topic, revisiting our heritage and those of you who tuned in, and probably even those of you who will be um, looking at it later on this evening again, we know that you'll be blessed and you'll be drawn closer to Jesus. So we just want to say thank you. At this point in time, we ask Pastor Vincent to pray for us and to pray for you as we close for today. Thank you very much. Let us pray. We are thankful, Lord, for our heritage. It is a rich heritage, Lord. And it defines who we are. It also, Lord, as we study where we have come from, it helps us to realize where we are going. So, Lord, I pray that uh, this study that we had, that many have been blessed. And because of this study, that many have been drawn closer to Jesus, to have a closer walk with him. Thank you, Lord, for those who have contributed. Thank you for this program, Pastor's Corner. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, and be blessed.